morning. Thank you for coming. My name is Dennis Amson. I live in St. Johnsbury. Um, I'd like to thank all the supporters here, all of you in Orange, who have come to stand with us to protect our children. Uh, we've had a lot of questions about who we are. Uh, we are a group of individuals who happen to be Vermont law enforcement officers. We're here on our own to voice our opinion on S-55, <coughs> the bill uh, as it now stands in the House. We feel that the amendments that have been added to the bill beyond the first five sections uh, that were originally put forth will be completely ineffective and will violate the constitutional rights of Vermont citizens to self-defense and to bear arms, particularly the so-called high-capacity magazine ban. It will not make our kids or anyone any safer. It will be unenforceable from a law enforcement standpoint. There are easily tens of thousands of this type of magazine here in our state, possibly more. There will be no reasonable way to enforce such a ban. Further, these magazines do not make a firearm more lethal. <clears throat> we want to be clear. Creating laws that criminalize what Vermonters have done safely for many years due to uninformed beliefs and perceptions is a betrayal to the people of our great state. This will have no impact on gun deaths, yet will restrict and prevent honest Vermont citizens who choose to exercise their constitutional right to protect themselves and their families. We too are parents, and we too want to protect our children in their schools, in our homes, and elsewhere. This bill not only does not do that, it actually makes it harder to protect kids and others through restricting the right to bear arms. Our message to our representatives and our senators is this. Don't take away Vermonters' right to protect themselves and their families, only to leave them prey to criminals who do not play by the rules. We want to offer our help and encourage our politicians to involve law enforcement when they are drafting legislation in areas that are familiar to police officers. Officers who would give anything to be there to protect citizens, but recognize that we cannot be everywhere all the time. Vermonters should not be restricted in their rights to protect themselves. Further, any bill of this type that will so obviously be such a decisive piece of legislation needs to include public comment. To not allow that is akin to gun laws passed in the dark of night in other states such as New York. We are not New York. At this time, I'd like to uh, recognize Senator Joe Benning, who would like to say a few words. So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, the irony of a criminal defense attorney standing shoulder to shoulder <laughs> with law enforcement. <laughs> oh, the irony of being a person who has never owned a gun in his life standing shoulder to shoulder with people dressed in orange. And I want to make clear before I begin that I am not a member of the NRA. I have never, to the best of my knowledge, received a donation from the NRA. And I've never owned a gun and probably never will. But I'm here because I am a fierce proponent of that document that binds all of us together as a society called the Vermont Constitution. The Vermont Constitution does not grant you the right to bear arms so you can hunt. The specific language says you have the right to bear arms for the defense of yourself. And there is a tremendous difference between those two concepts. So when I see a bill come out that would deny an individual the right to protect themselves from an aggressor who will not abide by the legislation in question, that has me concerned deeply. Now, just to talk for a moment about S-55, the bill that brought us all here together this morning. When S-55 was in Senate Judiciary Committee, which I am a member and vice chair, it had one provision in it. The state has been collecting arms for many, many years and had not the ability to sell them 
to dispose of them to clear out the storage space. For that reason, the Senate Judiciary Committee passed a unanimous bill that said this is how we will allow firearms to be sold. It was that simple until it hit the Senate floor. When it hit the Senate floor, two provisions were added to it. One was a provision for anyone aged 18 to 20 to not be able to purchase firearms. Now, if one goes by the theory that anyone in that age group is irresponsible and shouldn't have a firearms, I would understand the logic of saying you may not possess such a firearm. But I do not understand the logic that prevents you from purchasing a firearm. So I ask myself, what is the calamity that has brought us here? School shootings, obviously. How will that provision actually prevent school shootings? I would argue it will not. It had another component to it, and that was background checks. And after looking at the 17 most known mass shootings in this country, including the schools in Parkland, Columbine, Sandy Hook, and Virginia Tech, those individuals who were the shooters either passed a background check or obtained their weapons from someone else who did. So I ask myself, how will this background check actually solve the problem of school shootings? and I come up with the conclusion it won't. Why is this important? In my district, the Caledonia District, the school in Newark, Vermont, is approximately 40 to 45 minutes away from the nearest state police barracks in St. Johnsbury, where somebody to my left actually works. What is it we have done in this bill, as it left the Senate floor, that actually addresses the question, what do we do? to prevent the immediate threat of harm to our school in Newark? The answer is absolutely nothing. Why aren't we here with signs protesting that we need to have more secure schools? That the doors to our schools should be narrowed to one entry point that is secure? Why are we not here talking about how to develop programs to teach children to recognize in each other not only what they are doing to themselves to cause individual students to become isolated and alienated, depressed, and sometimes committing antisocial behavior, why are we not addressing that with this language? Why are we not talking about trying to figure out the ways that students can help look around and see something and then teach them how to say something without fear of retribution? The most heroic individual in the state of Vermont right now is not in Vermont. It's a lady named Angela McDevitt from Poughkeepsie, New York. She had the courage to stand up amongst her compatriots and say, something is not right here. I want to make sure something bad doesn't happen. Why are we not promoting programs to help kids like her actually make a difference in what we are facing? I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm very frustrated knowing that our constitutional rights are under attack, and in fact, the proposed solutions will not produce the desired result. At best, the theory behind each and every one of them is, eventually, over time, there will be less guns in the world, or somebody with a mind that's already gravitated to the point of being a shooter will maybe not receive them or be delayed in receiving them. That doesn't help the students in Newark. And it shouldn't help any of the students in any of this state. So I am hoping that when the legislation does get further discussed on the floor, that it goes away. Or when it comes back to the Senate, that the 17 to 13 vote that it left the Senate on is turned around. Because we are not solving the problem that is immediately in front of us. I'm going to hand it over to Jensen Wilhoyd in the House, and he'll tell you about the provisions that got added that made it even worse when it left the House. Bravo.
Thank you, Senator Benning. Again, my name is Jansen Lloyd. I'm a representative from St. Johnsbury. And like Senator Benning, it also is a unique, but I think also a very wonderful Vermont opportunity today. Again, because I too am a criminal defense and ju a juvenile defender in Caledonia, Essex, and Orleans County. And again, it was, it was having funny um, just remarks from some of the deputies from my neck of the woods today. It's like, nice to see you somewhere other than court. Um, but, but again, but, but the point of the matter is, you know, just as vigorously as, as, as Joe and, and so many of my compatriots on the defense bar have, have done um, various um, ways to try to, to, try to uh, represent our, those that, 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 we, that we represent in court under, under the first, the fourth, the fifth, sixth, eighth, fourteenth amendment, all of those are important. I, I too am, am, am someone that doesn't own a gun. I too am a member of the ACLU, and I too believe in protecting all of our liberties. And that's why I am also here today, because I, I, I cannot even imagine our state, the, a, a state of liberty, um, to, to be able to restrict um, the, the, the rights granted um, through our, not only our U.S. Constitution, but even more so under, under the Vermont Constitutional, uh, Constitutional Article 16. And so, in, in doing so, um, I'm, I'm proud to stand with, with law enforcement officers, um, sportsmen and women, um, throughout the state of Vermont to protect those rights. But as, as Joe alluded to, we did receive the further amended S-55 in the House Judiciary um, from the Senate. And from there, more was added. And as, as many, many in the room and, and the press know, there were, there were a lot of uh, things that were on the table that but luckily at least this year were removed, at least th thus far. However, a couple of things um, were added on to, but the one I want to specifically talk about was um, limits of, of capacity size of magazines. And again, I'm glad that I have sportsmen around, around, around too, because I'll be honest with you, when, when I first saw that, I'm like, well, that seems to make sense. I mean, who, who wants to support, you know, uh, uh, um, excess magazine capacities? But remarkably, it's amazing when you get information how that changes minds. Because if you look at the vote last week, even in a very one-sided um, House um, um, body, that only passed 79 to 66. So and yet, yet my caucus only has a third of the body. And so, so why is that? The, ra the reality is because it was, it was completely ineffective. Not only it is true, as I was alluded to by, by Dennis earlier, the amount of magazines that, 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 that are above what would be now a legal amount throughout the state, but again, the reality of, of the various um, completely um, legal and responsible um, rifles that are out there for sportsmen, especially competitive sportsmen, that that is their capacity size. Uh, that, that does nothing but actually take a fringe upon the rights of someone that, that is just a, a, a God-fearing, law-abiding citizen. And, and further, uh, if, if even the thought was, even if that's the case, I don't care, we need to get rid of these. Well, the fact of the matter is, the, the people of Vermont actually are concerned that now the only people that will have these are the, are the bad people. And, and so, in fact, I, I just heard um, evidence even over the weekend that, this, that the store down in Brattleboro uh, completely sold out of, 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 of all of their magazines that would now be illegal. They're gone. They're done. So, so again, law-abiding citizens are, are taking note and trying to, to get what they need. And so if this was actually trying to, to, to limit something, it's quite the opposite. And so I, I do think um, the members of law enforcement that have come together today as civilians, because who better to hear from a how to best protect Vermonters than law enforcement? And more so, who better understands how to protect our schools than law enforcement? And I, I look forward and, and hope and challenge all of us to start listening to them, start listening to everyone that's actually out there trying to protect Vermonters so that we, we can keep this, this state safe. And certainly, S55 is not the answer. I'm going to turn it now back to Dennis, who's, who's going to open up um, the floor to, to, to any questions people might have. Thank you. First, we're going to hear from Chief Aaron Cochran of the Hardwick Police Department. Good morning, folks. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you for, for coming. Um, 
there are uh, multiple law enforcement officers throughout the room today that were uh, not allowed to come in, in uh, uniform. Uh, so I'd just like to recognize, recognize them as well and, and thank them for being here. I, I can assure you, uh, I am a generational Vermonter. Uh, my third great grandfather fought with the 13th Vermont Regiment right. um, at Gettysburg, um, <clears throat> Company H. He was an artillery uh, company. Uh, anybody who knows their uh, history uh, knows that the uh, 13th Vermont Regiment was pivotal in Pickett's charge um, as they flanked <laughs> General Pickett. So um, he fought because he was fighting for the people. Um, my father uh, fought during Vietnam in the Army. Um, he as well is here today. And he is here, again, fighting for the people. Um, <clears throat> I would uh, say that that is my job. I, I took an oath uh, more than 15 years ago uh, to serve the people of this great state um, and protect your rights. That's why I'm here today. And that's why uh, Dennis and I have, have worked this uh, over the past weekend, we have discussed it with representatives. Um, and uh, again, thank you for being here. And we're here for you. I'm glad to see that we have some support uh, from you as well. Thank you. Thanks. I'd be happy to take any questions. How many, how many law enforcement? officers are, are part of this group or this effort? Uh, we don't know. Uh, it's, it's a fairly new effort and it's it's growing by the hour. Do you have any, I, can, I can't any give you a number. I'm sorry, I can't. Even if, if who are here today? Here today, we haven't taken a tally of the number that are here today. Sorry. <laughs> Is there a name for the group? Uh, Vermont Law Enforcement Officers Against Gun Control. Or Vermont Law Enforcement Against Gun Control. How come, how come you could come in uniform, but some people couldn't? I can't answer that except that I'm the chief. Um, <laughs> some that work um, obviously have to uh, go with what their uh, department policy is and so on, and department heads have asked. Yeah, and I can add to that a little bit. It's, it wouldn't be appropriate for me and some other officers to come here and uh, uh, claim to represent our agencies or departments. Uh, it's just, we're, we're here as individual officers and as Vermont citizens uh, who are really concerned about the safety of our kids and doing something that is actually going to work. Thank you. I see a hand. Yeah, yeah. So there were a couple of attorneys talking and also an attorney. Um, and just, you insist that this is unconstitutional and I'd like you to address that part because I completely disagree with you. <laughs> and I think it's been challenged constitutionally and found to be constitutional in other settings, so I'm sort of curious about that. Well, let me be very clear. The Constitution that I'm talking about is the Vermont Constitution. Right, and the Vermont Constitution, to the best of my knowledge, has never had a challenge. It may shortly, but to date, to the best of my knowledge, has never had an exact challenge on this issue. I acknowledge that other states or the federal government have gone down the way of having conversation about what is legal and what is not. The Supreme Court in Heller actually said, your right to bear arms exists. It is not sacrosanct. It is subject to restriction. But normally, those restrictions come with a compelling state interest and language that is narrowly drawn to address the specific problem and is not written over broad. So my question back to you is, what is there about the language as it currently exists that you believe will protect my kids in Newark Street School who can't get access to somebody 40 minutes away and a school shooting could be, well, I think every school shooting we have seen in the past 10 years would fit within that 40 minute time period. So. We're going to have that conversation, and I would submit that the way it is written is overly broad, and it does not directly address the problem that's in front of us. It takes a divergent turn to try to get gun control under the radar screen. 
But that's not the problem that is in front of us, I would submit. There's no yeah. idea. Yeah. Yeah. Any color? Number one, thank you, Vermont law enforcement, for saying it was. Number two, there was one Vermont constitutional provision that was overturned, and that would be the state versus, uh, oh boy. Rosenthal. Rosenthal. Excuse me? Rosenthal. Rosenthal. Rosenthal, where the Vermont Supreme Court declared permits repugnant to the Constitution. And that was literally, I think, our only Vermont Supreme Court decision. But that in itself makes the individual right stand. And we will be in court fighting against this unconscionable and unconstitutional bill. Thank you. Mr. Governor, I do appreciate uh, the, the statements, but I, I, I think we are going to direct it more to, toward questions. And so does anyone still have a, a question? Uh, either Dennis or the Chief, uh, as you survey the political landscape right now, what gives you hope that you can put this genie back in the bottle, as it were, as it relates to these four provisions that are now being considered? Well, I can only speak to my personal experience, and, and I believe that the um, Anybody in this room that you see wearing orange can explain this as well, if not better, than I can. And, and that is we have facts in the way of, of numbers, and we have uh, the truth on our side. Uh, history has shown that uh, if, if you apply uh, similar legislation to, to other locales, uh, the more gun control that you enact in an area, uh, violent crime has a tendency to go up as uh, citizens are allowed to protect themselves through, uh, be it concealed carry that has opened up in areas, violent crime goes down. Uh, if, uh, if what we're going to do is make laws that are going to restrict uh, citizens from being able to protect themselves, uh, how is that gonna affect the criminal that's gonna prey on our citizens and our kids? Uh, it's gonna have no effect on the criminal, it's only going to restrict uh, those who, who are, want to protect themselves, want to protect their kids. Sir, if S55 does pass your reading today, what then? I would defer to uh, Jansen. <laughs> well, no, Senate will be back to jo in Joe's Bowl House. So goes, it goes back to the Senate. Um, sure. It has been modified considerably since it left the Senate, so the Senate's going to be asked the question, do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you propose further amendments in the process? Beyond procedural, sir, if, if I might excuse me, what does it mean for the for the folks here today? I understand that's not the goal, but if it does move forward, does your position change? Does the message change? Or does it continue? When one seeks to make an argument about preserving your constitutional rights, that argument should never change. You may have legislation out there that has gone through and somebody believes uh, that was appropriate, but whatever means are necessary by way of legal challenges should continue. There will be people who are directly impacted. Let's take, for instance, the uh, Century Arms folks in Swan. You pass a bill that has magazine capacity limited, and all of a sudden a lot of your product that you've been manufacturing is no longer there. How do you react? when you have suddenly lost the reason to employ 100 or so people. You file litigation, and you have to keep that fight up. I am hoping with that one component that my governor will actually change his mind on this bill, because that is far beyond anything that left the Senate when he was talking about whether he could support it. I have yet to hear what his reaction would be on that particular issue, but it is the kind of thing that you raise that we all need to be paying attention to. The unintended consequences have not been fully discussed. A lot of these people are here today are angry because they have not felt like they've had their day at the legislature. And I can sympathize with that. So if there is something coming out of the House that ends up back in the Senate, we're going to have a very healthy debate once again. 
And if for some reason or other it does get by the Senate, there'll be another healthy debate before the governor signs it. And if the governor should sign it, I am hoping that there will be every legal means expended in order to try to combat what has happened here. Could any of the police speak? Uh, could I you let the police speak to the enforceability of the provisions in S55? Specifically, there was a mention of the high capacity magazine restriction, that that would be difficult to enforce. Could you just walk us through what that would look like? Well, these magazines, uh, they're not, magazines aren't serialized like firearms. Uh, if, if you make a, uh, pass a law that says, well, this item is now going to be illegal to sell uh, after, let's say, July 1st, how is anybody going to know when that magazine was purchased? Uh, you know, if somebody uh, chose to go to New Hampshire and purchase one of those magazines and bring it back to the state, a law enforcement officer uh, does not uh, have any way of knowing when a magazine was purchased and when it was not. And as I said before, there's at a minimum tens of thousands of these magazines, possibly hundreds of thousands of these magazines in this state alone. Uh, it, it's, it's completely unenforceable. Question for Senator Bennett. If I could just add to that, um, law enforcement has had an extreme burden, as you know, over the past several years uh, with the drug crime problem that we have in the state uh, with heroin, and I can tell you uh, crack cocaine is another uh, up-and-coming problem uh, that we've seen. And <clears throat> adding this burden onto law enforcement to track down magazines with over 10 rounds with a capacity over 10 rounds is a burden that we can't hold. Uh, we, we are focused on, on the drug problem right now, and we need to stay focused on that uh, in order to, to uh, change the landscape back to the Vermont that we all know. Senator Benningham. Well, just hang on a second. I want to respond to that provision as well. And by the way, it's a lot of fun being able to step up to a podium after I usually cross examine these guys. <laughs> Um, one other provision that is completely unenforceable is the background check. Mm -hmm. As one of my colleagues on the Senate floor said, if a transfer takes place in the woods, will anybody hear it? <laughs> if, if this legislation passes, and Paul Heinz wants to make another purchase in a parking lot, how will police ever know that that has happened unless Paul or the other person self-report? Now, I've been representing alleged criminals for 35 years. I don't know any one of them that would be going through the motions of self-reporting their activity. And that's, that's one of the things I find so frustrating about this legislation. How will it protect the kids in Newark Street School? It won't. I'm sorry, Bill, go ahead. the Rosenthal case, the underlying case to that is uh, State v. Carlton goes back a few more years, and that really is the core of our right to carry unimpinged by permits and registration. It basically stated that the Supreme Court saw in our Constitution multiple places where the intent of carrying is at the heart of the right, and that if your intent is not felonious or malicious or aggravated in any violent way, that your right is unimpingeable, you cannot restrict it, period. And so it seems to me that this ban of any type on commonly used types and accessories flies in the face of that and assumes felonious intent on the part of the grand population just to catch a few criminals. So Bill, um, a bachelor's degree, three years in law school, then get past the bar exam and you're good. Okay. Um, I want to be clear that I know why you guys are making those statements. I said earlier that there hadn't been legislation on this subject. I'm talking about legislation on the proposals that are in S55. There have been Supreme Court opinions in Vermont that have delineated what the right is, but we've never challenged these specific provisions, and that's what I was talking about. I hope that's a little clearer, but thanks for that. Great. 
Somebody said earlier that if there's more gun control, the violent crime goes up. So I just want to clarify, are you saying that if, if S55 passes, that there will be more violent crime? Or what kind of impact are you projecting? What I'm saying is that if this passes, the only people that are going to be, how, it, how it's going to work here in Vermont, the only people that are going to be restricted are law-abiding citizens. Uh, the criminals are not going to be restricted. So would, would there be a harm that you foresee as a result of this, people actually being injured or? or well, I, I think it goes back to the old saying, uh, never bring a knife to a gunfight. If, if uh, uh, you are going to restrict a person's right to protect themselves and defend themselves and their family, yet you're not going to restrict, there's no way to restrict the criminal from doing that, then you're putting the, the average citizen at a disadvantage. May I? If a criminal comes into my house with a 30-round magazine and I'm limited to a 10-round magazine, he's got 20 more shots than I do. Dennis, have, uh, have any, uh, other than those who are here as individuals, have any uh, police departments or other law enforcement organizations uh, backed your organization in any official capacity? Yes, actually, uh, Sheriff uh, Bill Boniak, uh, the sheriff in Orange County, is the president of the uh, Vermont Sheriff's Association. He wanted to be here today, but uh, took ill and could not make it. Uh, they have uh, uh, been very supportive over the, the original uh, bill as it was drafted with the uh, first five sections until it, it started to morph into what we're talking about here today. How do you respond to critics who have said that this organization and the name of it might confuse members of the public into thinking that state law enforcement agencies have, have taken an official stance on this political issue? Well, then I would encourage uh, folks to uh, do a little research and read up. Yeah. It's, it's really that simple to know uh, what you're looking into and, and what a group represents and, and who they are. Question in the back. Thank you for everyone for being here. Is there any more information on what's going to take place this afternoon? It appears that they want us out of here before there's some kind of accountability, at least publicly. Yeah. <laughs> All I, all I can can say is that that I received word from from my from from my leadership. I'm a I'm a Republican, so the, um, my leadership was informed that that the um, that they received word from from House leadership, which you hear that term means the Democrat leadership, um, that that this bill is going to be taken up in the afternoon. It's not it's not going to be in the morning. Nancy Johnson just moved it on all of us like working. Here. Yeah. So, but again, I, I, we can, we can, we can. Um, I, I, that's all. That's all I know. We can, we can, and see why the move happened. But that's that's why it moved. I, I do want to speak, if I, if I, if I may, to um, Joe brought up um, can, uh, some concerns re regarding the um, the the, um, the piece regarding background checks and and something that I brought up a little bit on the floor. But the more and more I've thought about it over the weekend, it, it really has concerned me too about. Going back to some of those unintended con consequences that was alluded to as well, and actually maybe uh, the potential of actually hindering um, people's willingness to actually um, seek treatment if needed, um, even medically uh, treatment with respect to if if someone um, does have has severe, uh, severe pain or other issues and, and actually do um, use medicinal marijuana. Um, a part of this proposal too is, as we all know, that any any kind of transfer, and then again, this isn't a sale. Too, I, I just want to make it even clear from members of the press that was here, because I saw so many of the lines said private sales. This is so much more than that. This is also transfers, gifts. You, you know, your best friend that you've known since they were, you know, you were three. Um, you know, now you know, giving it to, to him at 80. You you know, even even then you're gonna have to find an FFL if you can find one to, to, to actually do this transfer for you as as a mere gift. And the and the concern I have is is for 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 Vermonters that, that quite frankly might, you know, because um, I know there's people at different at, at different um, places when it comes to marijuana, but at least under in this body we've We've been, I think, pretty much universal over the last few votes with respect to medicinal marijuana and the need to actually have that as, as a way to, to treat persons. But under the, the guidelines of the, of the, uh, of the um, background check, um, there's a section that, that, that you, you and the, the transfer have to consent to that, that you, you know that you are not 
you know, unlawfully possessing or, or using marijuana. It even has in bold print and, and big bold black letters um, makes it clear that even if your state has, has legalized marijuana for, for um, medicinal or recreational use, it's still against federal law. And so it directs that if you're doing that, you still have to check no. So think about the reality here. So then you, uh, so then you really have one of two choices then. Um, either if, if you're someone that, that, that is treating yourself that way, um, then you need to either lie, which on the next page of thing, you, you're subjecting yourself to a, 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 a felony of, for, for perjury with the federal government. I think all of us have, who have watched things have happened even recently and also recently. I mean, that's always how people get, get caught in, in federal cases. Um, either that happens to you and that individual, um, or, or, you know, so, so then, uh, so then you, you lie about it so that we can have the gun, or you don't protect yourself. And, and I don't want to put anybody in that situation. That, that, that just, that, that doesn't seem right or proper. Yes, sir. The Parkland shooter, which was a tragic situation in Florida, <clears throat> 39 complaints were filed against that individual, including the FBI, local law enforcement, school officials, and he was a student here. Didn't government fail us and had yes. nothing to do with the guns? I, I, 39 I, I just came back from Florida from 10 days down there. And I was like 30 miles from that school. I'm just talking to strangers. Not one person ever said anything about the guns. They just said our government just failed. Yeah, another point that could be made regarding the tragedy in Florida is uh, the shooter did not use high-capacity magazines. All oh, right, no one's going to stop somebody. Oh, we don't, we don't get to do that. Are there any more questions for the press? Other else, we, I do have to go vote on some amendments on this bill. Uh, so. Let me take a swing at that because I want to make sure everybody here knows we actually have done something in the building to take care of the problem you're talking about, and that is S-221. It's the only bill we have right now that would look into the developing mind of a shooter and provide authorities with the ability to try to interdict. I can't stress that enough. It passed the Senate unanimously. I hope it gets through the House unanimously. And we actually come out of here working to provide protection for those kids in the Newark Street School and in every other school in the state. We'll take one more question, and then we're going to wrap it up. The, the, the other piece. You've had about 10 uh, questions. Let's she's a reporter. This is a press conference. conference. So well, what about everybody else? Well, you this is what you've been doing to us. Right. You allowed us to testify. Well, well, you're pushing us away. Let some of the other people over here. the press sure. We're going to take your questions. Why no hearings? Exactly. Hold on. We're going to take your question, too. The other piece of S55 that has not been mentioned is the ban on bump stocks. Is that something that uh, the leaders of this press conference would support? I can tell you, you know, regarding bump stocks, when, when after Las Vegas, that's where, where the, uh, the world became uh, aware of, uh, of bump stocks. And uh, if you speak to any serious uh, firearms enthusiast, uh, I, I would say many law enforcement, I can't speak for all law enforcement, uh, trainers, uh, people that have worked in tactical environments, they're going to tell you that a bump stock is a novelty item. Uh, there's a reason why you don't see bump stocks on uh, SWAT teams, for example. Uh, they do make a gun uh, sound like a machine gun. They do allow that gun to spew more bullets faster out the barrel, but they don't increase the lethality of a gun. Imagine if the Las Vegas shooter, uh, from his perch, had used a bolt-action scoped rifle like uh, a, a majority of hunters here in Vermont use or similar to what they use how d much more deadly that could have been. Um, you know, that's, that's a simple uh, hunting type gun, not a tactical gun. Uh, the bump stock is a novelty item. Nobody got too bent out of shape about it. Even the NRA was on board uh, with, with the bump stock and, and uh, reclassifying them as a different type of firearm, uh, much like a machine gun, say. But uh, it, it then morphed from bump stocks onto what we have today. But, but you would support that piece of the bill to add uh, state law? Uh, as a group, I can't speak to that. Again, uh, you, you asked personally, about numbers. Personally, do you support that piece? Personally, I guess I haven't got too uh, bent out of shape about it. But uh, it's, it's getting to the point, uh, to the principle of the matter at this point. 
and we have one more question. Um, sir, these questions will follow you, not as law enforcement, not as attorneys, as private citizens of Vermont, how do you feel about this house, the people's house, excluding the citizens from giving testimony on S-55? That is the process. <laughs> Well, as, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, to me, it's kind of like dirty pool. Uh, I think that uh, especially on an issue like this, whether, whether it's gun control legislation, marijuana, uh, same-sex marriage, you, you name it. If it's an issue that happens to be dis di very divisive, uh, then our politicians need to hear the people and, and hear both sides or however many sides there are. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. We really appreciate your support. And uh, uh, I'll let the uh, politicians close. I want to thank you all for coming as well. And as a non gun owner, I know why I'm not allowing any of you to testify. You guys look ugly as hell to me. <laughs> but in all seriousness, in answering your question, this is the people's house. It always will be the people's That's house. Right. And the people should have the right not the press's to present. House. Not the press. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.